My guest today has an incredible story of recovery. Not only was he able to recover from MS himself, he also now helps his own patients on their path back to health. He is a fellow at the Royal College of General Practitioners in Australia. He's also a member of the Royal College of Physicians in the UK. He has a master's in sports medicine. He now practices lifestyle medicine. He is a heck of a gentleman with a heck of a story. With that, we welcome Dr. Sam Gartland to the exam room. Thank you so very much for being here, my friend. Thank you for having me, Chuck. It's, it's great to be here. Thank you so much. You are somebody who a lot of us can look up to and admire, not just because of the work that you're doing, but because it's your story that brought you here today. You have been able to overcome MS, correct? That's correct. Yeah, that's right, Chuck. I, I was um, diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. I had quite a a rapid early course with um, some some big relapses. Um, uh, I was 32 at the time. This is back in 2008. Uh, at the time, I was working in uh, uh, yeah critical care in, in in the UK, and uh, my first relapse was it was quite a major one. I I had some inflammation in my spinal cord. Um, it left me numb from the waist down. At times, I, I was unable to walk, um, and uh, yeah, yeah, quite a dramatic moment, but um, something that ultimately has had, had a really good outcome for me and, and many of the people around me and many people I know and absolutely transformed my view of medicine and my practice of medicine. And you know, that's what I'm looking forward to going through with you today. Yeah, I have no doubt that it's transformed your view on medicine, your view on life, mm. a view on pretty much everything. Um so you, when did you first get your, your official diagnosis? You said you were in your late twenties at that point. So it's 32. 32. But, um, yeah. But realistically, I, it was in common with a, a lot of illnesses and particularly a lot of autoimmune conditions. I'd, I'd felt unwell. I hadn't felt good for a number of years and I couldn't really put my finger on it. I knew I um, was struggling uh, with work. I was struggling with the shift pattern and, um, uh, and that's that's common to a lot of people. They feel this sort of sense of fatigue and, and that things aren't working right. But I didn't have any obvious symptoms. Uh, and then and then it started. I, I started getting some numbness and tingling and this for MS, this sort of trademark, uh, 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 this characteristic phenomenon that when you bend your chin forward, you, you exacerbate all the numbness in, in your legs. And I, I knew pretty much straight away what it was. But um <laughs> I uh, I tried to ignore it. It was coming at a really bad time for me. It was coming. Uh, <laughs> this just sounds so silly saying this, but uh, I had some big exams coming up, and I was like, "Oh my god!" You know, and if this is what I think it is, there's there's probably not much I can do anyway. Um, and I, I tried to ignore it, but uh, but that never works. And um, uh, yeah, and then uh, so one day I uh, I drove to work, um, and I I literally couldn't walk from the car park to uh, the intensive care unit I was working in. And uh, fortunately, one of my old uh, colleagues saw me and and sort of spoke to me and, and examined me and we realized something major was amiss. So that, that was the sort of start of things. My gosh. Uh, I mean, 32. I mean, that's, that's such a young age and mm. you're working there. I mean, did, did you think that at that point, your career, your life as you knew it was coming to a halt? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I trained in, in the northwest of England, in Manchester, which has a particularly high prevalence of multiple sclerosis. And, and so I saw um, the, the outcome of this disease and it terrified me. I mean, I, I was used to seeing particularly young men have a very aggressive course of this disease and end up in wheelchairs very quickly. I mean, I've been involved where, you know, I've had to, yeah, uh, yeah, be involved in the emergency care of these people when they came in. And um, yeah, it was, I was absolutely terrified. And then at, at the time, you know, the, the drugs maybe slowed things down a little bit, but, but essentially uh, this was considered sort of very myst uh, mystical disease. Not, we didn't really know what caused it. And, and it's very serious. I remember actually during my medical school training, um, I was doing my neurology attachment and uh, uh, we had uh, a patient come to the outpatient clinic and 
the neurologist explained, well, you know, the next patient's coming in and we're going to have to give a very difficult diagnosis of uh, MS and we can't really tell them how it's going to go. We don't really have any uh, effective treatments. Um, and so this is going to be a difficult consult. And that, that, and then I'd, I also remembered from the pathology books about when you looked at, uh, yeah, the, the autopsies of people with, with MS, the, these horrific lesions in the brain and, and spinal cord. And yeah, the thought of that, going on in my body was was really terrifying and um uh yeah everything looked pretty bleak at that point i would imagine so uh, hmm. and and even though at that point you weren't 100 percent sure what caused this as a matter of fact you called it kind of a, a mystical disease uh well, did you did you think that it was less than coincidental that there were like a or there was a really high rate among young men in manchester specifically well, yeah, I mean, I was sort of aware that um, there was a, an issue with, you know, sunlight exposure. So it's, it, was, it was well known that, um, that a lack of vitamin D exposure, particularly as people are growing up, w w was implicated. Um, but diet and, and lifestyle just really hadn't um, crossed my radar. It had not, not been mentioned in my, my medical school training. Um, and so that, you know, that wasn't something that was on the agenda at all at that point. Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, clearly there are differences. I mean, the, the, the Orkneys and the Shetlands, just these islands just off the UK, um, the genes are similar, but the diets are different. And, and uh, <laughs> but obviously that wasn't ringing enough alarm bells for everyone at the time. What yeah. was your diet like at that point? Well, I sort of considered it was okay. I mean, I... Um, as you know doctors don't really get trained in nutrition and, and so i was cooking at home and i was cooking with you know fresh ingredients at home but it it was a western diet and it contained meat and dairy now at the weekends i'd, I'd have a takeaway and um, like a curry or uh, when i was on call i'd you know often in hospital you'd, you'd get sort of processed or deep fried foods but again i think um you know i thought oh generally i, I was fairly fairly healthy I, I i yeah i i prepared my own meals at home and and i exercised but of course the western diet is unhealthy and there's a reason why people following western diets get western illnesses and um and and that's what happened so let's walk through your story a little bit more here dr gartland um mm. you you get this diagnosis you kind of aren't able to make it from your car into the care center where you were working at the time yeah what happens from there yeah well a bit well, i think this happens to a lot of people with MS. so so they had the first scan and there, there was a big sort of lesion in the middle of my spinal cord which explained <laughs> why i was having the trouble walking but um i had a few sort of non-specific lesions in the brain and i think um that there's a reluctance um to to diagnose ms in, in unless you absolutely have to because of the the implications of it can be so serious and so um uh, you know there are diagnostic criteria that felt like well hang on you've had one episode here for it to be multiple you have to have had another episode of some new lesions evolve over time and you know if, if this is ms then you know it's going to be terrible for your you know your life insurance and um you know uh for your career prospects and all the rest of it so what we'll say is is that this has been a, an isolated syndrome and um you know you, you go off and see how you do and uh so okay, well, you know that that sounds better than saying I've got multiple sclerosis. But you know, I I was uh, uh, I was pretty unwell. I, I had a, a few months off work, and I um, it took me a while to to get the feeling back in my legs. But eventually, I did with some treatment with some steroids, and um, and then I'm embarrassed to say that I, I, I well a, a, a physician uh, who I'd worked with phoned me up and said, "Oh, you've got to read this book by this Australian professor," and. Um, uh, at the time, it was called Taking Control of MS, and um, I was very drawn to it. I, I worked in Australia in, in emergency and absolutely loved it, um, and actually only came back because I, I, I was feeling so lousy trying to work the shift. I, I didn't know what was wrong and felt like I needed to be nearer so, you know, support. But um, So this, this book, Taking Control, was written by Professor George Jelinek, who, who um, had been president of the College of Emergency Medicine, and he'd, he'd been editor of the Emergency Medical Journal. and. His story is absolutely amazing. Like his uh, mother had had MS and ultimately committed suicide because the effects had got so bad. And then uh, Professor Jelinek developed it when he was age 45. And 
he was an academic physician and, and went back through the literature and, and wrote this book and, and wrote a very compelling um, case that this was uh, largely mediated by lifestyle. And I remember thinking, well, you know, um, I sort of had some more sun and, and sort of thought I was eating a bit better, but but not really making the big lifestyle changes that you need to if you're going to deal with a one of these western diseases you have to do it all it's all or nothing if you if you want to recover um and i remember thinking well you know <laughs> if i have another relapse um uh i actually had the thought if i have not a, a, an optic neuritis where you get inflammation of, of, of the nerve to the eye then you know that will be my my sign that i really need to to do something with this and bizarrely my first night back on call anesthetizing that's exactly what happened i um uh, developed an optic neuritis in my right eye i couldn't see and, and knew exactly what it was and that's when sort of things really got serious for me because it was i was really it was just clear i, I, I was struggling with work i wasn't you know fit enough state to do my job and at the time i hadn't completed my training in critical care and i had a, a text message from the head of training saying, well, you know, we heard you're ill and can't carry on and we're happy to sign your papers off to say that you can retire through ill health and you go uh, have a think about what you're going to go and do with your life. And um, and that was, a, yeah, a pretty difficult moment. And um, uh, and again, I remember I, 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 you know, saw the neurologist and when my wife remembers this, I don't remember it at all. He said, oh, you know, some people mentioned diet, but that, that was it. Some people mentioned diet, but the mainstay was that you know, I was given the choice of um some medications and um the nurse came around to my home and you know that this was it uh, this is your treatment these are some injectable drugs you inject yourself with these every day um you know you'll relapse over time the disease will gradually progress and um you know the resources i was given at the time were things like from the multiple sclerosis society in the uk were you know sort of brochures with chair lifts and, and wheelchairs and, and things and it was um yeah, and then being given these medications, I just like so sort of looked at it, thinking this is a completely inadequate response to to what I'm facing. Yeah, I mean, it, it takes a lot for somebody, I think, then to kind of muster up the resolve and choose, you know, the the path less charted. Because instead mm. of going for those chair lifts and things that you were seeing in that brochure you then obviously took a, another direction and you wanted to take a closer look is, and I'm assuming then that's when you really started to focus in on the role diet and overall lifestyle play here. Yeah. So I'm just immensely grateful for the support I received from professor Jelinek and he was working uh, with the Gawler foundation uh, in, in the Arrow Valley, just outside of Melbourne. So, you know, at that point I wasn't working and, I was really sick. Like I was just exhausted all the time and, and really mentally at a really low web. I mean, so the whole paradigm I was facing there was of this unknown future with, with a progressive neurological condition. Um, but Professor Jelinek's work was, was a work of hope. But um, I, I guess my, my training and my understanding and paradigm was so strong at that time. I was like, well, surely if, if, simply just changing how you how you eat was going to have such a massive effect people would have been doing this for years i mean i remember uh, when interferon came out uh, and it's all over the bbc at the time oh you know we finally got a treatment for multiple sclerosis i mean totally ignoring the fact that and we'll, and we'll come on to this that um uh, professor roy swank from uh, the us had, had done a massive um you know, initial 34, then 50 year study showing that if people change their diet in MS, that they stabilized the disease and didn't progress and, and were fine. But that, that that had never, you know, never been brought to my attention previously. And and then obviously Professor Jelinek's work brought this up. But um, I flew out, he he ran programs um, in the Yarra Valley and I went out there. And this was basically a week of learning, going through the science behind it, which was really useful and and um, but also this was the first person say to actually say to me, look, I, I think you can be well. I, I think you can stabilize this disease and potentially recover. I mean, nobody had even raised that uh, possibility to me before. And actually, even when I was planning to go out, I had doctor friends of mine pull me to one side and say, 
you know, we think you're being given false hope here. Well, actually, there's false no hope. You know, we know, um, well, I'll just say, so So we know that the cause of MS is 25% genetic. So if you look at studies of uh, monozygotic twins, the risk of developing MS is 25% genetic. Uh, but the rest of it's all external. And when it comes down to the progression of the disease, there's huge data, like big studies. So big genetic studies of over 9,000 people uh, uh, in one looking uh, and finding no evidence for any association with genetics and disease severity. Um, uh, other studies looking at all the polymorphisms associated with disease progression. And again, there's no association with genes and, and, and progression of the disease. There's, there's one small study from Australia looking at 127 people showing a possible uh, effect in the first five years, but, th but that's not detectable after that point. So. And I guess that underpins the whole premise of the Overcoming MS program, which I followed and, and so uh, and, and many others have, that the course of this disease is, is predicted by external factors. And, and the majority of those are within your control. And, and we can talk about that. For sure. And, but yeah, I, I've just got to just say this. So I flew out to George and the first thing I saw when I saw him and you see this in the people you interview. So like, oh, you look well, you look vibrant and well. And, and you know, that was the main thing. I just saw this guy who was just absolutely full of life and meticulous with his interpretation of the evidence. And, and I knew it could be well. So let me ask you this. Um, what were your emotions that day when you were told like, hey, we think we can get you back to well. We we think that, you know, you can essentially beat this thing. Compare those to the day that you kind of collapsed in the parking lot. It was... Um, just the weight being taken off my shoulders and and that's what i was actually going to come on to this for all the science and and everything that we were taught during that week the most useful thing was being given hope and and um having some sessions on so meditating every day and and also expressing the grief um and then moving from a stage of sort of hopelessness um of disempowerment through to one of 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 feeling that actually you know that there's always hope um and and just letting go of the upset the grief and and all of those really powerful emotions and actually saying no i'm going to do whatever it takes to be well now and i've been given those tools and that's what i'm going to go and do and it just just a completely different headspace and a completely different energy you know you come you know one consult you're coming out absolutely just bereft of any any future of any hope um just uh, a feeling of being absolutely lost uh, sort of at the mercy of these things that you're injecting into your body through to having a very clear plan about what you have to go and do to be well what that looks like what what that commitment looks like and 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 the relationship that you have with yourself i mean uh, i know you all know this well chuck it's um how you're going to look after yourself, how you're going to value the life that you have. 100%. 100%. Well said, my friend. Um, I got to also ask you, though, about the reaction of your, your friends, your colleagues, when you told them like, hey, I'm not being sold false hope with this. I'm being sold false no hope through the traditional course of treatment. What I mean, just tell me what the look on their face was. Yeah, well, it's, it's amazing sort of how this has all played out <laughs> because <laughs> before I went, I, you know, there was this sort of, we were out and I got pulled to one side and, you know, what are you doing? <laughs> you're going to go and see these crazy Australians telling you that you're going to get better from this, like what's going on? And then um, sort of sharing the information um, and I'm really grateful that my friends and my family took such a active interest because they... They then read the research, they read the data, and it's just clear. Uh, it's just clear. And then they saw the recovery. And then, and then obviously, they've seen what's happened to me. And then, you know, they know people who've been affected by this illness or, or similar illnesses. And I know you've had Alan Desmond on talking about inflammatory bowel disease and so on. This same approach, you know, it's reversing diabetes, reversing heart disease, preventing the progression of prostate cancer, you know, reversing inflammatory bowel disease. They suddenly see that this is benefiting everything, and and so this all ripples out. This 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 knowledge passes through, and 
And these stories of recovery are just so immensely powerful and inspiring that they just get spread around. And and I, it's yeah, yeah. One of my best friends from medical school, um, he had a relative with MS, and and they're fine now. They followed this program. Uh, a work colleague, their niece, uh, recovered on the program with exactly the same experience that I had. You know, they got better. Their scans, scans normalized, and their neurologists are surprised. <laughs> I mean, that, that's that's the funny thing. How much research mm. is out there on MS and nutrition compared to, you know, we see just mountains and mountains and mountains of it with other diseases such as cancer. How does the volume of research compare? A huge amount of research now um, with respect to diet. Um, I mean, we have to go back to 1948 when Roy Swank, and we, we, I think that's just worth covering briefly. So Professor Roy Swank was um, a very eminent neurologist who worked at Harvard and McGill and later became professor of neurology at Oregon. And back in 1948, he recognized that um, uh, areas that were consuming large amounts of animal fats were developing high amounts of MS. And so then he set up a big trial showing that if people um, change their diet, they stabilize the disease and then publish this in The Lancet in 1990. Now, it's just a quirk of fate that this didn't become main mainstream practice because by the time he published, you needed to randomize controlled trial. It's not a fair comparison for him. Randomized controlled trials didn't exist when he started out. And you're right, nothing was really done with this. And there was a lull. Uh, no one really did any work with this information until... Professor George Jelinek got sick. Now, there are some notable exceptions in there. There's some smaller studies, but Professor George Jelinek gets sick. He he goes back through the literature and finds this and realizes, oh, you know, there's there's been a big omission here. Nobody's followed this major study up. And so, and largely, I think, because of Professor Jelinek's work, um, we've now seen a, a big, a, a renewed interest in, in the role of, of diet in, in MS. And so, I mean, there's, there's the work that him and his unit have done. So the uh, Stop MS study. So Professor Jelinek, when when he he'd read read this, he he put a little note up on his fridge and said, well, you know, whole food, plant based diet, good vitamin D level, exercise, meditation. These are things you need to do. And then started running these programs. And sure enough, people in collecting data, and then people who were following these programs were getting better. And so in, in his research, uh, he published results at one year and at five years, and people were getting better. And, you know, you compare that to the drug literature, which always just records how, how, how people decline. Well, this is the first study showing people actually getting better. Um, and then he went on and created one of the largest studies in the MS literature, the Holism study, um, looking at health outcomes and lifestyle measures in people with MS, uh, two and a half thousand people from 57 different countries. And it just absolutely uh, backed up everything that he suggested in the Overcoming MS program, that when people, you know, got rid of unhealthy fats, replaced them with healthy fats, their relapse rates dropped down, their quality of life improved, um, cutting out dairy reduced relapse rates by nearly 20%. Supplementing with flaxseed on on top of this dietary approach reduced relapse rates in the order of sixty percent. Um, I mean, it's actually transformed the the uh, landscape and and the management of this now. And I just um, we've got this conference, this really exciting conference coming up here, uh, nutrition and healthcare uh, yeah. in, in Melbourne, and we'll talk about that. But I'm speaking on a GP panel um, about the uh, you know integrating nutrition in, in, into your practice and. Um, just a, an astonishing amount of research now where people that there's the trialing programs to help empower people uh, develop, not just by MS but inflammatory bowel disease and so on and so this the, the literature is exploding on this now I mean what we I guess what we ultimately need is well-run large randomized controlled trials because that's what um, you know I guess some, some some doctors are demanding but I mean that's such a yeah, yeah I, I pedantic view of medicine, particularly with lifestyle medicine. It's funny, though. I mean, so going back to Dr. Swank's study here, I mean, you're, you're saying he yeah. started looking at this in 1948. The results are published in 1990. So yeah, you're still looking amazing. at like four decades worth of data here that was basically ignored because the randomized clinical trials didn't exist at that point when he began. Well, <clears throat> yeah, 
so Professor Jelinek covers that very well in his book, and and I think there's a number of reasons that, that, that there's that the criticism that it wasn't a randomised controlled trial, but um, as Jelinek correctly points out, this was just a quirk of fate because um, Minow had shown that you could recover from pernicious anemia with a chopped liver diet, but uh, um, you know that was the same type of study, and he won the Nobel Prize for it. And um, so if Swank had published some years earlier, then this wouldn't even be an issue. And um, the other thing that um, Professor Jelinek points out in his book is that uh, at the time there were anonymous editorials in The Lancet and basically they shot Swank's work down, which is just, you know, just such a petty bit of um, one-upmanship in medicine, isn't it? You know, that this isn't a randomised controlled trial, therefore the role of diet remains unproven. And, you know, and within that you've, you've just, you know, sort of really, I guess, dampened down any interest at all for what was basically an untreatable disease at the time. I mean, I think the medics have to take a long, hard look at themselves over that. Yeah. 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 Uh, I would, I would say so. Um, question going back to your particular recovery, how long did it take for you to really see noticeable results after you began eating this way? Yeah, it's a really great question. And it's something I get asked all the time. So I, I noticed within yeah, weeks to months, just my energy levels were just, just improving massively. And, um, you know, so, so I'd gone from not working at all, just being absolutely exhausted all the time. Um, I, I started following the program and immediately, well, you know, getting hope that just transforms you anyway, because it was like, okay, I, I can do this now. I have to thank, um, my, my, partner who's now my wife uh, Lisette she she helped me immensely making you know eating in the same way that I do uh and, and so, so all the food we had at home was, was suitable um but yeah I just started feeling better within within weeks the energy levels went back up and then I'd previously qualified as a, a GP a, fa a family medicine doctor and I went back to work um just two days a week with a big gap in the middle so I could have a bit of rest and um, and I was just meticulous about my lifestyle then. I was meditating, um, exercising, eating correctly and just taking time. And you know, I don't know when it really was. I just, uh, there are a few sort of markers along the way, you know, a few months into it. I was like, oh, I feel good, you know, and I used to do a bit of running. So I went out and ran a half marathon in the fastest time I'd ever done. And <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I think well, me. everyone around me was pretty shocked how <laughs> i was too like you know i hadn't done any training for it <laughs> and but i just had this whole new lease of life and um well now i've done the sports medicine you know when you when you eat plant-based food your your performance will improve it's uh that, that's just where the evidence is and and so gradually yeah i think within six months i, I was back to working full-time now that that wasn't in shift work i was working regular hours so i had enough time to look after myself but you know, certainly within within 12 months, my energy levels were back. I was working full time. And then that's when I felt confident enough to say, look, I just want to live in a better climate and moved over to Australia. Yeah. And and this was yeah. how many years ago now? Yeah. So, um, so the diagnosis was 2008 and I moved to Australia in 2010. And so, yeah, within a, within a couple, two and a half years, really, I was I was I was good. Yeah. Yes. So healthy is completely normal for you now, huh? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, I've got to tell you about this because this was quite a fun sort of thing that happened. So um, I am, um, uh, you know, I loved Australia. I love Australia. It's just a fantastic country. I love the nature, the space, uh, the, the optimism of the people. It's, it's great. And then so I came over to work and uh, as a GP here and um, and I wanted to stay. And, and obviously, when it came to the visa process, they were like, look, no, you've got a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. You're going to get sick and become a person on the system. <laughs> uh, no, we, we, we're not we're not sort of keen to let you in. And I was just really fortunate. Uh, Professor Jelinek was publishing work at that time. And it, he um, he very kindly supported my uh, my appeal in this process and said, you know, people following this program are getting better. And then um, uh so well look, you should probably go and see a neurologist and and i went to see a neurologist and and we had a chat and he, he said you know i'm feeling good i'm following this program but he, he we didn't really talk he didn't want to talk too much about that but we said well let's do an mri scan and and see how you're doing and um and even though i feel absolutely fantastically well there's still that bit of you when you when you go for these tests where you're just like 
uh, you know, all the dreads coming up. Like if this scan is terrible, I'm, you know, I'm just, it's just going to be such a major setback. And and uh, I've got to say, I just admire people who can turn up and go to the doctor and get these tests because uh, you know, when you realise sort of how you feel and, and what's at stake when you go into this. But yeah, I had the scan and uh, and I, I took the films home. They, they all looked okay to me. And uh, um, I went to go and see him for the follow-up appointment. He'd changed offices and, and my sat-nav took me the wrong way. And I knew he needed to get off on holiday. And he was waiting for me outside. And I really wanted to speak to you. He goes, I, I hardly ever get to give people good news. He goes, but your scan's completely fine. There's no evidence of MS. <laughs> and um, so, <laughs> so I was a bit like, oh, <laughs> you know, wow. You know, and... Um, and like now, when when I speak uh, and uh, communicate with other people in the Overcoming MS program, you know, this is an experience that's common to a lot, lot, a lot of people. And I'm not saying it is for everyone, but a lot of people re report this. And but this was, you know, this is a paradigm shift, and it's certainly a, a you know, something that that sort of shocks a lot of doctors. Um, anyway, I thought that was a fun story to share. All right, that is a fun story. It, it makes me wonder yeah. though, you know, if somebody's hearing this right now and they're struggling or they have a family member who is, you know, how would you recommend they bring this up with their own uh, doctors? Yeah, well, I think, you know, hopefully their doctors will be discussing it with them. As I had to remind um, one of the neurologists here when, uh, when we had a mutual patient who who recovered again, his scan normalised. I was like, he said, "Oh well, you know, he thinks the diet that you recommended to him helped." And I was like, "Well, Professor, if you check the January 2018 editorial of the journal Neurology, you'd see that all these measures are recommended um, by your professional body. Um, so everything that we're saying is backed up by the evidence, and it's it's the recommendation of, or it should be the recommendations of their neurologist now and." And there's that editorial there that, that says that clearly. Um, but um, there's some really great resources. I think the number one I'd recommend people to check out would be the Overcoming MS website. So www.overcomingms.org. Um, and that's a, that will have everything that, that, that's needed there. So that uh, goes through the steps of the Overcoming MS program. It's uh, got links to... And, and you can download all the publications there uh, that, that um, Professor Jelinek and his team have produced. Um, uh, there's some really good books. Um, I know, uh, I, I mean, I think Professor Jelinek's work, the Overcoming MS um, book is is just one of the most useful books you can read. It's, it's It really goes into the science and depth. So that really appeals to me and lots of other people because you know, it's just there. It's really empowering to work your way through that. And, and it's endorsed by a lot of really good neurologists. Um, Dr. Bieber in the States, who, who, who does some fantastic stuff on YouTube and uh, and has also written some good books on MS. The um, And then just last year, we wrote the um, roadmap, uh, the Overcoming MS uh, Handbook for Recovery. It's a sort of very hands-on book, which... Um, is a very practical book detailing all different aspects of, of dealing with this disease. So uh, the dealing with the initial diagnosis and then what you do with work, treatment choices, building your healthcare team, building resilience, um, uh, you know, issues with pregnancy and MS. And so, so that's a really uh, helpful book um, uh, for, and, and goes into detail about what can be done to help family members. So, you know, Swank was really clear when he he did his work that if if family members um, uh, took the lifestyle changes, undertook the lifestyle changes, none of them developed MS. And um, uh, there's some other things on there with respect to vitamin D levels and so on that you can do that, that are strongly protective. So the Overcoming MS books, the Overcoming MS website, um, I have to say MS Australia uh, have a good website and the MS Trust in the UK I found really good. I'm not so familiar with the US um, organisations. Fair enough. But look, uh, we're going to drop a link to overcomingms.org in the show description or in the episode notes mm. for you. So go ahead and, and get your one click there. Um, two more quick ones before we talk about the conference. Uh, first of all, again, just pertinent to your own story. How has your outlook on life changed since you've been able to completely reverse this disease? Yeah. Um, well, I, I live it every day. I don't change what I'm doing. Uh, I'm just incredibly grateful for the work of Professor Jelinek and Overcoming MS because that showed me what I needed to do. And so I'm mindful of how I live. Um, 
I, I, but I love exercise. I love eating well. I love how I love feeling good. You know, that's that's um, just just nice. You know, to be able to really fully enjoy life, um, and and then bringing that forward, uh, just like I know with you doing this, that just feel so passionate about sharing this information, that empowering people with this information. That you know, you can be well. You can live a full and vibrant life, and and it's it's not complicated you know this is you know i've got a family member at the moment who's who's dealing with quite a major diagnosis and they were sort of sending me some stuff through on all these different biochemical pathways and it's sort of quite interesting to read some of this stuff but actually you know looking after your mental health exercise and then just a meticulous diet and and you're going to feel good and you're going to feel well and it's uh, just a self-fulfilling thing and and then how it affects me now it's just um every condition that i see i mean as a, a doctor in a western country all the diseases i see are lifestyle related and to be able to say to people look there's these really simple things you can do to help yourself and it will transform your life is is just a really wonderful thing and a really satisfying way to work oh man i bet you get some hugs and high fives in your office don't you don't you? Yeah. Yeah, I know you do. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, isn't that, you know, that's that's how how humans feel good, isn't it? This connectedness. Absolutely. Absolutely. No question about it. Um, and I can't let you go also without just asking you briefly about your time working in the Premier League. You and I also share a passion for sports. And I think yeah. it's tremendous that you got to work with such high level athletes over there. Um, mm. I mean, my goodness gracious. I'm just going to ask you one question because this is not the focus of the interview. This is just yeah. me having fun. Uh, mm. You know, how much of a premium is put on nutrition with those guys? And are there any who are really focused in on eating a plant based diet? So I, I worked in the Premier League back in so around from around 2005 to yeah, uh, 2007. Um, I have to say not a huge amount on nutrition at that time. I mean, my knowledge of nutrition wasn't much. Um, I know now that that's changed a lot. So you, you've got a lot of very famous um, soccer players, particularly people like Chris Smalling and so on, who've, who've become uh, plant-based. Um, there's a whole plant-based team in one of the lower divisions and, and they're moving up. Um, it, it's getting there. Um, and then later when I came over here to Australia and worked with one of the A-League clubs here, um, there was more of an awareness with, with some of the younger players, but again, not, not massive. And then it's, it's, it's coming through a lot more now. And I think particularly with the, you know, uh, release of game changes and things, then there's a real uh, knowledge that this is the way to go. Um, so it's changing. Yeah, man. All right. Now let's talk about this yeah. conference coming up February 17th through the 19th in Melbourne, uh, the nutrition and healthcare conference. I mean, I I'm excited about this. This is being put on for, uh, doctors for nutrition here. I mean, from what I understand, this is a Australasia's only whole food plant-based nutrition conference, right? So this is kind of a one of a kind thing, but you don't have to be in Melbourne to be there. I know that there's a virtual option as well. Um, it sounds kind of like they're going to be covering a little bit of everything, Dr. Garten, uh, Gartland. I mean, you've got gut health, brain health, heart health, hormones. You've got healthier skin, uh, cancer, diabetes, obesity, all kinds of things there. If you were going to give advice to practitioners to really make sure that they pay attention to just one of those topics, is there one that you're looking forward to the most? Oh, I can't say there's one. <laughs> so there's, listen, there's just such, I mean, if you've seen the lineup for the speakers uh, we've got coming, it's going to be absolutely sensational. You know, we've got the Scherzai's coming over. We've got Alan Desmond, Gemma Newman. Uh, we've got some great uh, uh, local Australian speakers coming through. And uh, we've got Cordell Wesselstein dialing in. And uh, we've also got Dr. Gregor as well. I mean, it's just an absolutely fantastic lineup. And I think anybody who comes along is just going to be, so inspired and and come away with so much useful information that they can uh, bring into their practice. I think it's just an absolutely sensational um, meeting that we're going to be having, and and such a delight to have it because obviously we had one back in 2019, but then we had COVID, so this is the first time that we'll all be able to get together and do this again. So yeah, 
but there's, there's just a, a whole load there and and it's going to be a fantastic day a fantastic weekend sorry Absolutely. I mean, the energy yeah. that weekend is just going to be off the charts. Uh, please give Dr. Uh, Gemma Newman my best. She's uh, now my co-host for a new show that we're doing here uh, called One Healthy World. I love her to death, man. She is a little spark plug that just <laughs> brings so much to the table. So um, y'all have fun while you're there. And there's a link to the conference right now in the show description and in the episode notes, or just hop over to doctorsfornutrition.org to register. Hey, listen, Dr. Gartland, this has just been absolutely Absolutely fantastic, my friend. Um, I want to give you an invitation to come back on the show anytime. I love your story. I love your passion, your enthusiasm, everything, man. Uh, you're just on point and you're a breath of fresh air, hope and inspiration for so many people, man. So it would be my honor to bring you back at some point. Thank you so much, Chuck. And thank you for having me on. And I'm, I'm building some lifestyle medicine programs at the moment. And I, I look forward to speaking with you again and, and updating you what I'm doing and, and what I'm bringing to this. And thank you for your work as well. I know we spoke just before uh, we started recording the show, but the resource that you provide is just so useful. It's, it's been immensely useful for my patients, for my family members. And, and I want to thank you for all the work that you're doing in the Physicians Committee. I mean, it's it's just fantastic. And and just yeah amazing please keep it up oh i've got no plans on stopping man and and thank you yeah. so much for for sharing the show i'm really honored that so many people are getting something out of it you know it's uh it's not like covering sports i mean that was fun for me but it wasn't doing the world a heck of a lot of good but to be able to bring this kind of information and stories like yours to so many mm. people around the world i mean it is it is really the thrill of a lifetime man so Thank you, man. You, you make all of this worth it, my friend. Nice. Thank you. If your health IQ was a couple of points higher than it was a few minutes ago, go ahead and like this video or subscribe to the YouTube channel. And to take it even higher, head over to Apple Podcast or wherever you get your favorite shows. Look for the exam room by the Physicians Committee. Hit the subscribe button there as well and help to make your world a healthier place.